I think we have a, a lot to get through. Um, and we've got a, a, a panel here, um, obviously very eager to share news and uh, experience with you. So just by way of introduction, um, I just wanted to welcome on behalf of Ross Charles and Moore Kingston Smith um, to this webinar and for the panel, um, who I'll introduce in a bit, um, for taking the time out of their busy days to come and be with us today to share some of their experiences in the last few months. Bit of housekeeping, we are keeping everyone on mute. Um, if you have any questions, which we appreciate and would encourage you to filter through the Q&A, um, just at the bottom of your screens, if you can't see it, it should appear as you move your cursor around. Um, we will try and get to as many as we can. I know Vanessa from Morkington Smith sent out an email requesting any specific questions that you might have, and we have received those, so we will try and make sure we cover the ones that we have received. Um, we will do our best to accommodate you on your Q&A. If some of your questions are for particular individuals, please say so. Um, and again, we'll do our best to accommodate that. The plan is that the session will be about 40 minutes um, with the view that we have about 20 minutes of Q&A time um, within that. Um, so maximum an hour um, and we'll see how we go. Before I forget, um, Vanessa also from All Kingston Smith will be sending out a survey monkey just to see what it was you liked about this session. Do you want to see another one um, in the same sort of format somewhere in a few months? Um, and again, we'll do our best to accommodate. So without further ado, I would like to introduce our panel. Julie from the ISC, David from ISBA, Jonathan from GDST, and Kevin from Rothschilds and Co Wealth Management. And really here around the table, the panel um, was really put together for their varied views for the people that, and the companies that they represent. Um, and so therefore, hopefully it will be a really interesting session. Um, please, I encourage you to ask questions. Um, as you know, it's been a very interesting last few months, not to say the least, um, from everyone around this panel, from everyone obviously joining us. And there has been a lot going on. So what I thought I'd start with first is with Kevin, is really just to give us an overview of the markets, because I know he's had lots of questions about why no things are going up and down or not doing much at all. And I thought, actually, let's get the experts in to tell us um, what it is our investments are doing and why they're doing it. So, Kevin, if I could hand over to you. Hey, thanks, Anjali. And obviously, I'm going to talk in a very narrow context. I'm talking just about economics and finance here. I appreciate the wider humanitarian impact of this horrible event that we're living through. But uh, we're focusing here just on the narrow technical context. And to give you our conclusion up front, um, this is a very special uh, and alarming event, but we've been optimistic that it may not be a relatively lengthy event. The downturn is special in many, many ways. It was the most sudden, the deepest, uh, the most agreed upon of all the downturns I can remember seeing. But the most important way in which it was special for me is that it was the first ever deliberate downturn we've seen in the economy. We effectively shut a large part of the economy to deal with the virus. And that makes me, that gives me grounds for hope, if you like, going forward, because as long as the contagion rates peak, subside, and don't revive significantly, then the shutdowns will loosen. They have been loosening, and economies can be switched back on once again. And as of May, that's been what's happening. We've actually seen economic growth picking up. The low point in the economy probably was in April since when things have been improving. And from the point of view of endowment portfolios, so school port investment portfolios, remember capital markets look forwards, they anticipate what's going to happen to the economy. They were very quick to see the crunch coming. They fell very sharply in March, but then they also anticipated this being a relatively short downturn and they've been rebounding since. So many schools will find that their balanced portfolios which are investing in a range of assets, but with equities in particular, occupying a big part of those portfolios, they're down on where they were, but not sensationally so. They have managed to rebound. And one of the reasons that uh, markets are looking across the valley, as we say, a little bit earlier and a little bit further ahead, further into the future um, than, than usual, is that as economies are recovering, 
policy remains very friendly. So interest rates are staying low. As we heard here in the UK yesterday, fiscal policy remains pretty supportive. So wrapping it all together, we're cautiously optimistic that this may not be as lengthy a decline in business activity as people have been fearing. Final point, I've just been focusing on the immediate impact and revival. I'm reading a lot of things uh, in, in the media and a lot of things written by economists about how this virus changes everything and how about we'll never get back to anything approximating what we used to think of normality. I would keep those big picture uh, predictions at arm's length for the time being. Nobody expected to be where we are now a few months ago. In a few months time, we might find that memories are relatively short, that habits have not changed as much as people fear. This idea that people won't spend again because we now don't need to consume. A lot of people can't afford not to go out and spend, as it were. I think many relationships will come back. And my guess is that the future is going to resemble the past to a greater extent than many people are suggesting. Thank you, Kevin. I mean, uh, we, we get lots and lots of questions um, about this, no doubt. And obviously the fundamental part is that a lot of schools are shored up by their investment portfolio. So actually, if they're not generating the income that they think they should be, um, it puts them into a, a, a bit more of a financial pickle than they might already be in. Um, have you seen that, Kevin? Yeah, well, definitely, because um, investment income was relatively low to begin with, at least from the interest rate part of the portfolio. So bonds and cash as investments, there weren't very many uh, investment incomes to be taken to begin with. And what interest rates there were are now even smaller than they were. So some portions of investment income have fallen and some equities, some stocks, some big companies, banks and oil companies here in the UK have had to cut their dividends. So investment income is even scarcer now than it was previously. But if you're able to view your portfolio in a longer term context, if you if you're in the lucky position of not having to take that income out um, as soon as it's there, as it were, and, and relying on that income, if you are able to take a longer term view, and you think in terms of the total return coming from the portfolio, it's possible looking forwards that the damage done there may not be as great as the interest rates and the dividend cuts currently seem to suggest. Some of those dividends will be rebuilt. It'll take time, but they will come back over time. And markets, as I say, are anticipating return to growth and overall returns have been stronger perhaps in the last couple of months than the income returns would seem to suggest. But it's not easy on, in terms of investment income to begin with, and it's not going to get any easier for a while because those interest rates will stay low for a long time, I'm guessing. Yes, and they have made headlines. And I, I think alongside the investment headlines, we've seen a few others, um, you know, the, the scary stories of independent schools forced to close um, their doors permanently, either through not getting any of their investment income through the door, for example, but losing children, and obviously um, the impact of COVID-19. We've also seen some of those headlines about um, uh, furlough, you know, independent schools accessing um, furlough money, you know, taxpayers' expense, those sorts of torrid headlines. So I really wanted to hear from possibly Julie from the ISC, really just about some of these headlines and actually the impact of COVID-19 on the sector as a whole and, and the view of um, the Independent Schools Council on that. Thank you, Angelique. Well, my perspective is that of a former head of prep schools with day and boarding pupils and now Independent Schools Council, which as many of you know, represents 1400 independent schools through their member associations at national level. So we've been looking at the national media, dealing with the DfE and other government departments. If I was still a headmistress, I would have been one of those suddenly having to stretch out of my comfort zone, working more closely with the bursa on logistics this term. I would be putting on a brave face, but I would be exhausted now, fearful of the fallout coming from summer grades. And we've seen a bit of that from the IB um, and anxious about September and ensuring a remote learning plan B alongside returning to school. But as it is, from an ISC perspective, um, we've been lobbying for the sector's interest and, and we continue to put the case that independent schools play an important part socially, economically and educationally across the country. 
Um, much of our day-to-day -day work has been funneling daily queries and requests for clarification to civil servants and ministers. So we've got an idea of what's going on on the front line for schools, but we're mainly dealing with the associations. Um, so what have we observed from this standpoint over recent months? Well, it's certainly been a crisis for schools. And we thought before Christmas, last Christmas, that the Labour Against Private Schools movement was the big story, but it's completely put that into the shade. Um, there's no doubt that schools have had to start crisis planning. Um, for example, in January at the ISC census, there were over 10,000 pupils from China in ISC schools. And we don't know how many of those we can expect to see back in September. Yet, at the same time, this is a really adaptable sector, and we know this, and while the schools who were already struggling might be falling away in small numbers, the sector has responded well, it seems, to potential opportunities. So, for example, a speedy development of remote education options because ed tech became a necessity. As a result of the positive reporting of online learning, we're finding that schools in some cases are reporting increased interest from parents who now might decide it is worth investing in education for their children through school fees. And that's even without the extensive co-curricular programme that our schools are so well known for. There's also hope that the teacher recruitment crisis will relent over the next academic year because it presents as a, a career with some solidity behind it. So th there's a potential benefit there. About a month or so ago, there was a lot of wringing of hands because the lockdown was stretching onwards, the COVID data set wasn't looking good, and the reputation of our country globally caused increasing concern. But over recent weeks, there has been this increased public confidence in a return to school site in September, led by the government. There's also been some helpful DfE guidance um, and that gave schools permission to bill parents for full fees in September. So with all of that came the hope that this might be just a shorter term blip. And I was really reassured to hear Kevin's um, comments about that rather than a longer term crisis, um, because in terms of cash flow, you know, this is our sector is very, very sensitive. So the longer it goes on, the, the worse it is suddenly for our sector. Um, but at the same time, even if there is normality of some kind restored in September, the effects of this whole crisis on the sector aren't going to become clear for another 18 months or so. It'll unfold and we can continue to live with quite a lot of uncertainty over September. Um, but more positively, quarantine arrangements are relenting somewhat. Visa centres are reopening around the world. Um, there's, a, there's a possibility that our country may have turned a corner. So we're waiting to see not only how the schools themselves fare, but what the effect of an economic recession is going to be on our fee paying parents. So the sector we're expecting to restructure itself into a more streamlined model of economic operations at the same time as demonstrating value for money and still attracting pupils. Um, so you, you might be interested to know that in the 1990s crash, ISC schools lost around 11,000 pupils. We're now up to 600,000 in total as of January. Most of those pupils were lost from boarding. Um, and that 90s crash took about four years for the sector to recover after, afterwards. So that's a point of comparison. Um, but one of the points I wanted to make is that I've become really aware of the importance of schools maintaining excellent customer relationships. And it seemed to me as an observer from slightly outside, that it was the schools who best manage their communications with sensitivity and gentle understanding who suffered the least in terms of parental complaints over fees. And it was the schools where the teaching staff and leaders had the strongest, most trusting relationships with parents who suffered the least in terms of parental complaint over online education. Relationships with staff as well, already perhaps strained owing to TPS pressures, those have been crucial. Um, and at least we can be grateful that our sector's teachers are less unionised uh, than in the state sector. But I think there is more criticism to come. Um, you mentioned furlough costs. 
Um, we know that the disadvantage gap will be increasingly under scrutiny. So from an ISC perspective, we're ready for potential challenges on business rates relief. Um, and ISC is going to continue to promote the partnerships agenda, showing that the community work and partnership work done by schools um, is supportive of our joint understanding with the TFE and demonstrates public benefit. Because we're also entering a new political phase. We've got the effects of Brexit still to come and we continue to be highlighted negatively as the privileged few by a less than friendly media. So that's the wider picture, but in individual schools, it's important to focus on maintaining confidence and morale while behind the scenes reviewing the business model, which of course is, is the focus today. Can I, can I pick something up with you, Julie? Jonathan, can I go to you with the view that um, Julie's mentioned quite a few things to do with the impact of schools. And whilst, um, you know, GDST being quite a big group, obviously, out there, you are prime target, no doubt, for, for, for newspaper headlines on complaints and not enough reduction in fees. But I just wondered how GDST was sort of managing. You have boarding schools within um, some of your 25 schools. Um, I'm hearing stories um, of schools having to put in plans for maybe bringing back borders from overseas two weeks before the start of term, just to make sure from a quarantine point of view, um, no signs of a virus. Some are thinking of plan B, where they might not bring some children back until middle of um, the autumn term, i.e. after half term. I mean, are you grappling with some of those issues as well? Uh, yes, definitely we are. We have uh, one school in a network, the Royal High School Bath, um, which has um, a, a boarding population there. Um, and, and absolutely, those, that point is, is very real. So we've already got plans in place for uh, the, the girls to be um, quarantined in the boarding house. Um, we're actually going to bring them back at the same time, um, so beginning of September is the start of term, and their first two weeks will be, of term will be quarantined in the boarding house rather than coming back early. We think that's going to work work better all round. Um, and that's really what we'll be doing is having our guided home learning. Um, you know, they will participate in the learning, you know, the, the lessons, but actually based, you know, at a different part of the site. And um, so that's certainly the plan for the majority who we hope we can, can come back at the beginning of term. But what we've said to, to parents and we've held some boarding uh, forums for, for those parents overseas is that they can join at, at set interval. So absolutely uh, beginning of term would be ideal, but after half term and even potentially uh, beginning of January, um, if there are significant travel restrictions or, or health concerns, there. So it's, you know, we're, we're trying to be as flexible as we can be, but really we want the, the girls to, to return as soon as they can um, and participate in school life um, as they would be if, you know, they were normally on site. And, now, and picking up on one of our, Julie's other points is we are hearing sort of anecdotally that there has been interest exactly from parents where the state sector may not have um, shone itself in glory um, over some of the education provision. I think there has been a difference between primary and secondary, to be fair. Um, and London is its own market um, against probably the rest of the country. Um, are you noticing a, a difference around your schools in different areas, Jonathan? Yes, I think I think we are, and it's probably a continuation of of what we've seen over the recent years. In that London and the South East, the economy has been you know particularly buoyant. That's um, certainly helped the schools there, and somewhat more challenged um, out out in the you know further out in the country, and um, certainly our schools. You know, range from Newcastle to Portsmouth, from uh, Cardiff across to, to Norwich. So we uh, cover a you know a pretty broad geography, um, and we're seeing you know a, a different situation. But each school has got its own uh, competitive marketplace, um, and with you know a very strong uh, you know local competition there. So it's it's an interesting marketplace. But certainly we're probably seeing the London schools faring a little bit better in in prospects for September. But I think you know there's probably still plenty of uncertainty out there. We really won't know. Um, exactly what the pupils are going to be until the first week of term. So you know, we've got some strong indications, but there's still uncertainty there. No, uh, agreed. And and David, can I can I bring you in? Um, because obviously Julie started off on the sort of financial side, and you know we know that you know back in the 90s um, we lost a lot of schools. I think the prediction is that potentially we're going to lose um, you know schools now. Um, are you hearing that? Are you seeing that, David? Thank you, Anjali. I agree with everything that Julie said, and she always tells me that ISBA always does the doom and gloom, but I'm gonna try and find some reasons to be cheerful. Although starting off, we've had 32 permanent closures so far. 
about half of those schools are not in an ISC association, the other half are. I have to say the ones have closed though, were probably going to close for some reason or other anyway. It's not COVID per se, that just happens for being the catalyst. And if it hadn't have been COVID, it would have been something else. But I think if TPS and the employer contributions weren't a catalyst for change, add the two C's together, um, contributions and COVID, uh, then schools I think have had a very healthy dose of realism. And I think the only constant in the future will be change. I don't think we will ever go back to a kind of normality that looks exactly like it was pre-March. I think the businesses that will be the survivors, and there are undoubtedly good opportunities out there, but they will, as Julie acknowledged, uh, be schools that will change their business model that really will do future proofing, financial future proofing, not just tinkering at the edges with the odd redundancy or changing a set size, but really doing a fundamental root and branch review of how they do business. Now, in some schools, they are coming to the conclusion that actually we need to get together with somebody else. And I'm dealing with probably as many as 40 schools at the moment that are saying, look, we were fine in March, we've been impacted we can keep going but i think you know they see which way the winds of change are blowing and those winds are very chilly and this includes three to 18 schools including some hmc schools you know it's not just small prep schools it's not just rural schools it's across the board and they are looking at what the opportunities might be to merge with their local competitor we're finding large schools are interested in considering building sort of mini foundations, buying prep schools as a feeder or not. They may just be part of a group, um, but enjoying economies of scale. Um, you know, really revisiting how they're doing business. I'm aware of single sex girls schools, single sex boys schools talking now about merging their back office and having a shared service center. Why duplicate effort? We're also seeing, of course, the international investors uh, who, to some extent, are still in the market. I was speaking to a Chinese investor today who said, yeah, um, some Chinese investors are having difficulty getting cash out of the country. Others are sort of doing the patriotic thing, I think, and sitting on their cash in country. But quite a few Chinese investors are actually now based here and they are liquid and they can move very quickly. And I've, I'm working with 10 schools now that are towards the end of due diligence and all being well, the deals there will be signed. We're also though seeing UK based investors who are not asset strippers. You know, they are there for the long term future of education, but are interested in taking over schools that maybe are in distress, but are not zombie businesses. Um, and and we'll work with them to turn them around. So I think that's a reason to be cheerful that we will see uh, potentially bigger, stronger, future-proof schools. Because there's no doubt there are financial shocks coming down the road. This is a bit of the doom and gloom. Um, I have in my inbox two briefing notes from two firms of actuary that we will be publishing to ISBA members imminently suggesting that employer contributions will need to go up as high as 35 percent that is to respond to a low interest rate scenario the risk of negative interest rates although i'm a little encouraged by what kevin has said but it's the impact on the discount rate um, as part of the actuarial review and if that happens that will be in the nail in the coffin for many schools um, membership of TPS. But the point is, what if it only goes to 30%? That's good news at one level, but it's still a further, very large increase on the one we've only just swallowed. So that I think is one controllable cost, a material one that schools really need to think about now um, when they come back in September. ISBA's view is the loss of mandatory business rate relief in England will happen on a three to five year time frame. So when you're looking at scenario planning, that's quite a big chunk of additional expenditure. There are other financial factors that are 
from a, a prudent financial risk management perspective should be factored in. We're not scaremongering and being speculative. It is coming to pass. So in other words, if change is a constant, the change we need to see now is around the operating model, how we do business, and actually coming into a small group, a large group, and centralizing certain functions and so on is not a bad option. So long as the quality of the education is there, communication like Julie acknowledged, so long as we continue to offer all of the holistic benefits of an independent education, I don't think it matters if a school is charitable or proprietorial. You can be successful under both models and we've got to look to the future, the next 50 years, not the past 150. Agreed. And David, I mean, just picking up a point there is, um, I think if I could bring Jonathan here, do you see education changing somewhat now? I mean, we've had a huge amount of online learning for children. And I think one of the biggest things that we've seen is almost that cash cow is that some of our old established schools have huge old historic buildings. Um, the utilisation of those is not always great. Um, with now the sort of children now being used to home learning do do we think that somewhere in the future there's going to be a bit of a mix do we need these sort of white elephants that we've traditionally you know done our education from um you know are they going to be around in the next 10 to 15 years or can we not get rid of them that would be too harsh but you know change the utilization of them i think there is a market for both models we have climbed a you know many years of learning curve in a matter of days in the case of many schools, we've got to work out how we monetize that, you know, because technically now, if you've got a robust platform and robust online teaching, you have a global market that you didn't have before. You can appeal to the emerging middle classes around the world who can't afford the full Hogwarts experience, but would like to have some form of UK based education, maybe with flying faculty and other other models. And I think how we respond to that, that some of the winners will be the ones who, who are able to bottle up what they've learned and sell it at a profit to to an international market. But I think there will still be parents who would like, you know, the full independent school experience, you know, the rugby team, the hockey team, all of these kind of things. So I think suggestions of the death of the sector in that sense are premature. You know, it's old Mark Twain's old saying, I suspect on that one. Um, but it's saying that there's nothing stopping you doing things differently. Just because you've done it in a certain way for 200 years doesn't mean you have to continue like that. You can run things in parallel. And Jonathan, and Jonathan, thank you, David. Jonathan, is that GDST's sort of viewpoint on, on this as well? Yeah, I, I think we've you know moved you know in the the course of um, you know certainly the last three and a half months and, and in the, the early you know couple of weeks of it, we've moved on our um, education technology offer you know dramatically you know you know taking us huge leap of you know what might have otherwise taken three or five years, we've done in three or five weeks um, and really. Um, you know, the guided home learning that GDST has been offering in all its schools has been fantastically well received, um, um, you know, by, by the parents and, and the pupils. So, you know, we really have moved things on. Um, I probably agree with David that I think there's something a lot more to be said than, you know, as you know, those of us working from home have found um, in actually the, the collaboration, the spirit, the, you know, all the, 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 the co-curricular things that, that go on in a school. So I think, you know, the days of the independent school have got many, many decades to, uh, to come. But I think it's an interesting, you know, discussion to have as to how that's offered. And, you know, the, the, the UK education market has got such, you know, strength globally that there's probably going to be a, you know, a, a sea change in, in how we do things um, across the sector, I'm sure. Ultimately, you know, the elephant in the room remains affordability. And, you know, we, we've seen since 2004, fees in independent schools have gone up by 60%. So we no longer have the scope to absorb financial shocks by passing them on to the parents. We have seen this past term um, fee reductions. You can't charge the same fee for the online learning that you can for the face-to-face. -face. We are seeing many schools freezing fees in September at 2019 levels 
uh, either for one term or in most cases for the whole academic year. A corollary of that is some schools are now freezing salary increases as well, which goes to a, a whole raft of different issues. So schools have still got to grapple with that, which is another driver for change. And if they can run an alternative program in parallel, that could become the cash cow that enables them to offer cost-effective face-to-face education without having to have above inflation fee rises every year. Does that make sense? Yeah, I, I think there's a lot going on there. I think there's a lot for schools to grapple with. Um, Harrow have obviously been the leaders on the online yes. teaching market, and, and that will be an interesting one um, to see how they fare. And no doubt this came at a time where Harrow could probably romp home with the educational bit because they already had the platform up and up and running. So I think it's interesting times. Um, and I think we can't take our eye off the mark on affordability, um, especially in the current climate. But I am conscious that we've had a few questions on some other different subject matters. And whilst I, I don't want to be pessimistic, but I think we'd be remiss if we didn't actually also cover, and if I can go to you, Julie, the whole movement on things like Black Lives Matter, because obviously, there has been a lot of press around this from former students, current students, signing letters to their old alma maters, Harrow, Winchester, Haberdashers, St Paul's Girls, Eton, I mean, you name it, you know, in every sense of the words. And, you know, and outwardly calling out on racism, the curriculum itself um, that they want changed. Um, and I see have obviously been quoted in the press and I thought it'd be a good opportunity for Julie. And then maybe after that, if I could bring in back to Jonathan, obviously talking from GDST. And actually, I also want to then, after that, bring in Kevin as well, um, from a commercial view, just to, to give everyone a rounded picture of what's actually going on. So Julie, over to you. Yes, thank you. And associations, including ISC, have received those letters, accusations, petitions directly as well. So it's been quite a campaign. Um, it is, of course, important for schools to address the equalities, diversity and inclusion agenda. Um, and there are, fortunately, some great organisations already in existence who tackle this. So there's BAMED, um, ASCL have some resources. There's even some DFE resources and a pledge. Who knew? Um, so there, a lot of work has been done already that we can draw from. I think schools need to be careful not to be inadvertently swept into an activist movement just because they want to be seen as sympathetic there, there is there is a bit of a tripwire there um, of course schools need to deal with current accusations directly and they need to be listening to the lived experiences of alumni and pupils and staff and then they need to take a slightly longer term view and it, it's, it's a really complicated, multifaceted, broad, global set of social issues. So they need to be looking at how they develop their own school culture appropriately. Um, probably when working in this area, they'll want to leave a route open to broaden from black and Asian and minority ethnic pupils and staff across equalities for all the protected characteristics over time. As ever, it's important to get the communication right and set an open-minded tone where all of us uh, appreciate we're, we're willing to learn and adapt and, and get up to date on this. Um, so they should be listening and considering and then developing a strategy to prove that they have an active agenda. And, and this really is an issue for the entire school community. It's, it's not an easy, quick fix. So, Yes, schools are reviewing their curriculum. Um, some schools have got working parties set up already on this, probably a designated governor for this, or even a member of staff. Um, but the kinds of priority areas they're focusing on include representation on the governing body, recruitment opportunities and retention and promotion of BAME staff as role models, and then training for staff, governors, pupils and parents. So as for ISC itself, we're coordinating a cross-association inclusion group, um, drawing on lots of expertise, developing links with helpful resources, organisations and training agencies that can be shared then back out with associations and schools to help tackle some of those underlying issues. And actually, Irfan Latif, the head of DLD, is a delegate with us today and he posed the very first question on this subject and he's helping to advise us on that group. Um, 
and our starting position is developing understanding where are we culturally now where do we want to get to and then find the best actions to deal with the underlying issues it, you know it's a lot more than just a pr exercise it's an opportunity to improve the cultural education across school communities and and that's quite an exciting opportunity if it's dealt with well I, th I think it's a difficult one but i will be a bit controversial because i have heard people push back at me and say but angeli if there is no diversity on a governing board and there's no diversity within the teaching body exactly you can have all the policies in the world but actually you're not going to instill change and you know whilst julie i'm not directing that at you but maybe with those statements jonathan you might just want to talk about maybe what gdst are, are, are doing in that area sure thank you um so the gdst we certainly pride ourselves on our deeply held beliefs um you know, born of a vision of four uncompromising women um you know who refuse to accept that girls should not be educated in the same way that that, that boys were you know and this is uh, you know in the mid-victorian time so that's that's where we stem from and we're unequivocal called that uh, racism cannot be tolerated so uh, what, what we have done is formed a steering committee that's working on a, a gdst charter for action um, and it's going to the committee is going to be drawn from uh, across the gdst it's going to involve students and alumni as well as staff and senior leaders um, and we need to make sure that all those groups have the opportunity to influence and contribute to our goals and commitments before they come become finalized um, and those you know the areas that we're that we're looking at um, you know the key commitments of that charter will be centered around the most fundamental areas of um, organizational and school culture uh, the school curriculum um, and also staff career paths so really making sure that we we cover the you know all the areas that are that are relevant and it's it, absolutely it's not just a Paying lip service to, to this, this is absolutely, uh, you know, creating real change to make sure that you know we the commitment we have to diversity in, and inclusion is backed up by real change, um, and you know that will, you know, stand us in good stead for for a long time to come. But I think it's 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 how we do that and really you know bringing together the you know the communities and, and the stakeholders uh, in the whole organisation that's going to make a difference to how we, how we take things forward. Yeah, and, and, and our children are obviously going out in the world. And, and Kevin, it's quite interesting to maybe using Rothschilds as an example about how you find um, diversity with your own organisation and, and what you're doing about it. Well, we take it very seriously and not, not just recently. Um, from the very top of the firm down, um, you will find our owners and senior managers talking about the importance of balance and inclusion all the time. You'll find it on our websites. Uh, in, internally you'll see um, messages around the office about this um, we know we can do more and if, if this isn't a contradiction in, in terms we're also aware that sometimes there are subconscious biases there, and we try somehow to guard against those we can do more we're actively trying to do more and it's it's not because um, it's not only because it's the right thing to do of course but it's also good for business because if you don't employ the best people that you can find, irrespective of their background, then your productivity is going to be lower and your costs are going to be higher than otherwise would be the case. So it makes good business sense as well as being the right thing to do. Yeah, I, I think it's quite interesting. I think um, as the discussions have, have gone on, um, I was told um, in recently um, when, you know, when you're talking about racism, um, you know, someone said to me, they said, well, actually, when people stop seeing colour and just see the person, you've um, obliterated racism altogether. And I think that's quite an interesting observation that that's the point when you come back to what Kevin's saying, employing the best people for the job, um, regardless of colour, race or creed. Um, that's that's what we're after. Um, and, you know, in London, for example, you're, you're bound to get much more of a multicultural type of organisation. Um, when you take that approach. Um, I think like us and like you and like every school, there's more to be done, but certainly um, I think the issue is now highlighted and probably won't go away. Um, David, I didn't know if you wanted to add anything on, on to that. Um, obviously representing ISPA and seeing if you've had any comments from your own membership. David, we've got you on mute. You're still muted. There you go. I don't think I've got much to add that hasn't been said, to be honest. I think colleagues have 
set out their stall extremely well. You know, I agree with everything Kevin has said in particular about talent and uh, so on. Julie, in terms of the, you know, responses we're devising for the sector, you know, I'm finding that we get um, middle-aged white men um, saying, well, oh, we know what the problem is. Um, you know, we'll write a paper on it. But that, I think, is not the solution. You know, we need to be very inclusive in terms of deciding what we do next, how we respond as a sector. And uh, that is absolutely critical. So, so ISBA is also doing work around this, um, but also to help schools if they do get uh, an accusation of historic or current uh, racial harassment and bullying. Uh, because obviously the schools have to respond properly to that and not just do a, a trite knee-jerk uh, reaction. So nothing more to add. Now, can I pick up? I mean, we've, we've talked about a lot of topics at the moment, but I just wanted to go back to maybe the impact of um, the idea of schools potentially closing. Um, obviously, there are savings to be had maybe just by changing the way we educate. And I know David Woodgate's been talking and, and pushing the, the point about change. But we have seen a disparity, I think, between um, state and independent in some areas, um, prep and secondary, for argument's sake. Um, and I just wanted views around the table, really, just about um, what they've seen, and maybe starting back off with David, because I think some of this, these issues about mergers and acquisitions are coming from also a point of um, very nice to get the mergers and acquisitions going, but schools need to come at this from a point of strength, so you don't have to be in trouble to go down that road. And we're beginning to find more prep schools are getting into trouble, more so than the secondary. So it'll be interesting to hear David's thoughts on that for, to start with. You're right, I think, on your last comment about preps, because of course, by definition, preps are usually smaller. They don't have the endowments, they don't have the reserves necessarily. And of course, a lot of prep schools have borrowed quite heavily as part of the general arms race, you know, facility, uh, putting it into performing arts centres and equestrian centres and these kind of things. So I think we have quite a few prep schools that are over geared. But quite a few of the ones I'm talking to are saying, look, we're OK at the moment, but we can see which way the trends are going. We're having to fight a little bit more for pupils. Um, to bring them on board. Uh, we can see parental buying behaviour changing. You know, parents might have been furloughed and gone from quite a large discretionary income to no discretionary income at all. Um, we will see redundancies and we will see parents' businesses failing. That is inevitable. And that is saying, you know, maybe we should be talking to other schools from a position of relative strength. We're not a basket case. We've got a lot of pluses. So let's talk to a big school, a senior school, um, or to another prep about two of us coming together, you know, particularly if you've got two single sex schools, um, bringing them together as a co-ed. Uh, makes a lot of sense. I have to say where I'm finding prep schools are in particular difficulty is where they have a very strong religious element and that religious element is trumping uh, rational business making and they're trying to stick, keep going just because they've always you know been in the faith as it were but I think schools are getting stronger are saying well you know let's have a root and branch to use the same word uh, as I, I, I used before, a root and branch review of the curriculum, of setting, of all of these things, and redesign the way we do business. Why do we always do it like we've always done it? And, so and if I could, question. yeah, yeah, I think I think if I could bring Jonathan in on this. I mean, Jonathan, GDST has gone from strength to strength. You're now somewhat 25 schools. When you start your discussions, when you when you get involved with a school that might approach you. Um, you know, is it that, you know, you obviously you prefer to talk to a school from a position of, you know, they're still in a position of strength. Um, but what are the sorts of things that you look for? So, um, not in a very recent past, but uh, in sort of, you know, four, four to seven years ago, we have, you know, had some mergers within the, the GDST where we've, you know, looked at the strengths of local, you know, local competitors and thought, you know, how do we, you know, maximise that and bring value um, and sustainability to those schools. And I think that's the, you know, the key here is about sustainability and making sure that you know however 
a school is operating, whether it's one that's looking to, to merge or be acquired or, or, or uh, join forces, then it's, it's how do you make that school sustainable uh, in its local marketplace. And I think that's, that's probably the, the first point that we'd, we'd be thinking about and, and any uh, good business should be about, you know, how do you make sure that, you know, any you know, further in, in enhancement and expansion is going to be sustainable and additive to the whole organization. So, you know, we'd probably be reluctant to try and prop up a school that's, you know, really not going to fail. As David said earlier, it's not necessarily COVID that's going to make it fail, um, but there'll be other, you know, fundamental things that might uh, cause that problem. So I think um, it'll be difficult for us to take on that. You know, we don't have unlimited uh, pockets by any means. We're working very hard uh, to, to grow the schools that we have got already. So we'd be probably looking at you know, stronger schools and saying, you know, how can they benefit from uh, the strength of the, the GDST? Um, you know, our, our mission about, um, you know, where, the place where girls, the schools where girls learn without limits and really, you know, promote that and really, you know, grow the ethos of, of the GDST. And um, Julie, I mean, one of the things that we've seen um, across the board, and I think David was the one that mentioned it before, that it's irrelevant. Um, we had a question earlier about schools, whether they're commercial schools or charitable schools. And um, there was a question that was posed to us um, before the session started that um, parents seem to be much more on board suddenly under the COVID-19 of understanding the makeup of their own schools. I think I come from a position of, actually a school is a school and the ownership was never really part of um you know a decision to whether i send my child there um but the question was posed in a way that actually it seems to be coming part of the decision making process i mean have you had inquiries uh, about why schools might be charities versus commercial yes i was interested to see that when i started teaching i felt rightly or wrongly i'd prefer to work for a charitable trust than a proprietor. But I think you're right, Angelie, that in general, people are choosing the right school for their child. Location is a huge factor. Um, word of mouth recommendation has to be a good school. I, I would be very surprised if the ownership of the school was a, was a top priority. But I was very interested to see that perhaps parents are waking up to the difference when they hadn't noticed it at all before. But no, it's, it's not a thing that has come to our notice yet, but it may be early days. Can I come no. in there, Anjali? Absolutely. Yeah, I see no particular evidence that it's part of, you know, a fundamental part of the decision-making process. Um, you know, parents want a school where their children are going to be safe, where they're going to be happy, and where they will get um, and holistic education with nice children. And I still think those are the, the primary determinants of the decision. And if you're getting that, you know, there are great proprietorial schools and there are rubbish charitable ones, if don't quote me, and vice versa. And, and you know, you, you, you weigh things in the balance, but I'm not sure the ownership per se is, is an issue. No, and, and, and I certainly would have thought that too. I, th I think what's quite interesting, though, is in the mergers and acquisitions market at the moment, is that actually we are seeing charitable schools being taken over by commercial entities um, much more than we ever have in the past. I think in the past we saw that the charitable status was almost a barrier sometimes, even, even if it wasn't, but it, there was a perception. And I think that barrier has probably been broken down now. And we have seen a lot of schools actually moving towards commercial um, uh, groups than, than staying within the charitable sector. So I think we have seen a bit of a change there. I think David, would you agree? Maybe a little bit controversial, Anjali, but you know, schools that have financial problems, the financial problems are often merely a symptom of a failure of governance. And there is a question in some schools that the governance model is broken. Volunteer trustees isn't necessarily the way to run a school unless you've got very good trustees but we know that gets harder and harder you know we still have boards of governors with 30 odd people on them and that is not um a basis for good governance and i think one of the drivers for change is saying your governance can be much more agile more focused 
dare I say, more business orientated with a proprietorial approach, you can still have an advisory board that's looking after safeguarding and educational quality and lots of other things like that. But the fundamental business decisions are taken in a business-like way. And that is a change that I think, I would say it, wouldn't I? Uh, but I think that is, uh, that is a, a development for the good. Well, I, I was conscious of time and um, we, our participants are still there. And if they've got any questions, just as I broke my last question, if they, if they would um, want to put anything on the Q&A, please do. You've still got a few minutes. But I thought um, I would like to leave this session on a very positive step. So what I wanted to do with the panel is ask um, one by one if, if there was anything positive to come out of COVID-19, um, what would you think um, that would be? And David, I'm going to start with you, actually. I want a positive remark from, from ISPA. <laughs> oh, no, David, I've got you on mute. A, pos a, a catalyst for positive change. Yes. <laughs> Is there an example you could give, do you think? I am. Um... I am chair of governors of an HMC school, and it's really made us look very fundamentally at what we're doing and why we're doing it and what we don't need to do anymore. Very interesting. Kevin, can I go to you as you're next on my screen? So, yeah, but again, in the sort of uh, narrow context of economics, before we went into this, the big debate in my area was when is the next US recession coming? When is the next setback? Because we've been almost a decade without anything horrible happening. Now, we didn't anticipate this, but this is a pretty horrible event, and it may well have opened up the future somehow because we, we're now coming out of something bad rather than waiting for something bad to happen. So in a strange sort of way, I feel that the, the future has been opened up a little, and that's in terms of the way that we think about things, but also cyclically about when the next item of bad news might come along. We've had enough to last us for quite a while. Yes, I agree. Julie, can I go to you? Um, yeah, I'd like to come back to the online learning options um, because I come from a teaching background so I am not someone who's going to ever argue that remote education could be superior as a package to in-school education. I just couldn't, couldn't go that far. But when I'm thinking now about how we used to treat children who were off on long-term sick uh, or had a, you know, a bad break of a bone and they're stuck in hospital, Suddenly now we have a way of remaining in contact with those individuals, whatever the reason is that they can't be with us. Um, and now that suddenly we're all Zoom and Teams experts, we can maintain communication. It's not perfect, but wow, you know, so many more innovations and opportunities. It is a bit like having suddenly a million textbooks to choose from instead of one. So the resource available to education through this as, as David said, this sudden burst of EdTech ed activity, really exciting. Fantastic. And Jonathan? I'd certainly, you know, would have echoed exactly what Judy said in terms of the EdTech, but I think that what I would say is, you know, how our 25 schools have really drawn from the strength of the GDST network and also built from that. So what we've been doing, you know, year 11 and year 13 uh, pupils were we're in a particularly challenged state with exams being cancelled. So, for example, what we've done for um, for Year 11s is to give them a sort of bridging program through into A levels, uh, which has really you know bridged that gap between you know what they would have been doing as revision and, and getting ready for for moving on into the sixth form. And for Year 13 leavers, who you know in, I'm sure in lots of other places uh, have really just been been doing nothing and playing PlayStation. Um, you know what we've set up across the GDST family is uh, limitless learning. So what we've been doing is thinking about where uh, the girls uh, are going next and setting up uh, programs you know even members of the, the trust office team have been you know for you know looking at the, the university courses they're going on and how do they um, go ahead and how can we help them get ready for that so even though they're leaving us you know what can we still do to, to add value and finish their um, educational experience on a real high so I think the strength of that and all the other programs that we've run across the, the network have, have been fantastic uh, you know inspiring females um, is another program that's been run with you know tens of thousands of of participants online which has just you know given us a fantastic opportunity to to, to grow our influence so that, that's what I'd, I'd say is you know, several several key, key wins from the, the last few months. No, I think, I think that's fantastic. I think, I think from my own observation as, a, as an outsider into the industry is to say that actually I almost had a, a, a it's a perception, I'm not saying it's right, it, it was almost, we had been a bit sleepy for the last 10 to 15 years. 
and suddenly we've been faced with a huge and massive problem in our sector and I think we have literally risen to the occasion there you know not everyone I admit there will be some schools in there that, that have struggled but as a whole we have done what we do best be inventive we have gone out there and made sure that our children have had an education and I think our staff in the sector have probably been fantastic in rising to that occasion that has helped bolster those schools um, and the ones that have done really well are the ones exactly what Julie had said at the beginning communicated really well with their parents um, and really shown the parents and the children what the schools can do um, under a very short shrift shall we say so I think in the autumn is going to be very interesting um, and I'm hoping schools will really continue to rise to the occasion because I think that's what sets our sector out um, and apart from, from everything else. Um, so I think for us, I'm conscious of time, it's coming up to three o'clock. We, I don't think um, we've got any more questions. Um, so I wanted to thank our panel for giving up their time and for all the participants that have taken time to, to come and hear them. Um, so thank you all very much. And um, please feedback. <laughs>